Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us for Create Your Legacy, Maximize Your Impact. This is the second seminar in our new series on planned giving. I'm Robin Fowler, Vice President of St. Michael's Foundation, and I'm pleased to welcome all of you to our event. I would like to open the event with a land acknowledgement. As we gather today to connect for the work of St. Michael's Foundation, we acknowledge this land, the people, and all other beings, animate and inanimate today, as well as the ancestors. This area has been a place of communities coming together for well over 15,000 years. This land has been the territory of the Huron-Wendat and Petun Nations, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Walk Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and Confederacy of the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community. We are also mindful of broken covenants and the need to strive to make right with all our relations, sharing stories and telling the truth of this place. Miigwech, Niawa. We're all increasingly aware of our impact on present and future generations. Global events like the pandemic drive that home. We know you're committed to maximizing your positive impact now and in the future as supporters of St. Michael's Hospital and Providence Healthcare. Our speakers today will show you how you can boost that impact to create a meaningful legacy that will inspire future generations. Marvie Ricker and Mal Mark Halpern are top financial experts who specialize in legacy planning and philanthropy. Marvie Ricker is Managing Director of Family Philanthropy and Legacy Planning at BMO's Family Office. She helps clients give meaningful expression to their wealth through philanthropic legacy. Mark Halpern is CEO of WealthInsurance.com. He offers clients comprehensive estate planning solutions, working with an expert team of accountants, lawyers, bankers, and other financial professionals. In today's talk, they'll share strategies to maximize your generosity while minimizing your taxes to leave more for the people and causes you care about. Just some housekeeping notes before we begin. You'll find a Q&A chat box on your screen. Throughout the duration of our session today, if you think of a question for the speakers, just type it into the chat box. We'll hold all questions for the Q&A at the end of our event, and we'll pose as many questions as we can to the speakers. Please note this is a public event, and all questions submitted will be visible to our guests and attendees. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, click the tech support FAQ or tech support chat at the bottom of your screen, and one of our techs will help you. After the event, you will be sent a few survey questions. We would be very grateful if you would submit your answers. Today's seminar is being recorded. You'll receive a link to rewatch the session after the event. We welcome you to revisit the content yourself and share it with friends, family, and colleagues. And now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Marvie and Mark. Thank you, Robin. And hello, everyone. Um, my presentation is going to be rather different from that of Mark. I'm going to be um, talking from a more philosophical bent and also talking about the history of uh, philanthropy and how we've gotten to where we are today. Next slide, please. When talking about philanthropy, I like to quote uh, Warren Buffett particularly, who said, giving money away um, is easy, giving money away well is fiendishly difficult. And I'll come back to that. Belinda Gates said that philanthropy is not about the money. It's about using whatever resources you have at your fingertips and applying, the, applying them to improving the world. Okay, so let's just um, look as to why they're giving, as they're saying what they're saying. Let's uh, define what we mean by philanthropy. And I like to do that by contrasting it to charitable giving. Charitable giving is the kind of giving we all do all the time. You give to uh, your favorite institution once a year. You uh, support a friend who's running for a cause. You help the local hospital or university, whether in a campaign mode. But you don't necessarily expect to get involved with the organization, and you don't really expect them to tell you how they spent your $500. Philanthropy, however, is quite different. Um, 
it is, first of all, based in you and what your values are, your aspirations, your interests in the charitable sector. And it's also carried out in a way that is intended to make an impact on an issue. In other words, to do more than just do good, but to try to make a difference on something that's important to you. So in order to do that, obviously, you need to know something about the issues. You need to know what organizations are involved and what kind of work they're doing. You need to know how to make a good grant. You need to be able to evaluate what you're doing. So as you can see, it is really an activity that is much more involving of um, your emotions, your intellect, and maybe even your time than just charitable giving. And not that there's anything wrong with charitable giving, both are very good and necessary. So let's just stop for a moment to think about how this applies to your support of St. Michael's Hospital. Most of us uh, probably give on an annual basis uh, without really thinking about it, or we may leave um, a gift in our wills. And that's sort of like charitable giving. However, if you're a person who has um, a particular issue that's important to you because of something that's happened in your family or to yourself, you are probably more likely to want to support that particular uh, cause. And you will probably want to know more about what the hospital is doing in that area so that you can make um, a gift or a grant that is going to be impactful for the hospital and also um, important to you. For instance, um, St. Michael's is well known for its trauma care. So in order to support the hospital in this area, you may also be uh, supporting other programs like anti-concussion programs or whatever to help prevent uh, trauma. So as I said, uh, philanthropy is a, a somewhat more engaged approach to giving, but it does not imply, as Melinda Gates said, necessarily a lot of money. It is just a different way of thinking about things. Okay. Next slide. I'm going to be talking a little bit about how we've changed over time and how we've gone away from what used to be charitable giving to uh, more like philanthropy. Um, a number of years ago, Enveronics did some research on how Canada has changed over time and looked at the values of the generation that was born before the war and compared that to the baby boom generation as they hit the year 2000. So the people born before the uh, Second World War were very small c conservative. They tended to defer to authority figures. They deferred gratification. In other words, if they wanted a holiday or a new car, they would save for it. Um, they tended to be involved in organized religion. So Canada's motto of peace, order, and good government really defined the values of that generation. Baby boomers, however, were very independent. They were um, very much living in the moment, hedonistic, and much more interested in a spiritual quest than in organized religion. So the U.S. motto of life, liberty, and happiness is probably a better explanation of what's important to that group of people. Next. Along with a change in values, of course, came a change in approach to philanthropy. The conservative pre-World War II people tended to give because they felt guilty, or there was a sense of noblesse oblige, or their uh, religion told them that they should be giving a certain amount, and giving tended to be conspicuous. The baby boom generation, however, <clears throat> attacked uh, community problems with the sense that I know what's wrong and I'm going to fix it. I'm going to get involved. I want to see um, how things are done. I'm going to make things happen myself. This is going to be fun. It's going to be a great learning experience. And it, this type of giving is obviously less ostentatious. Next slide. Another big change is that um, the social problems have become much larger and far more complex. So starting around the 1980s, 
um, up until that time, government had more or less paid for our health care, our education, our social service needs. But these uh, were becoming very big ticket items. There were more people going on to post-secondary education. Healthcare was becoming much more complex and more expensive. Social problems also were becoming much bigger. So in order to meet the needs of the public, charities found that they had to start doing their own fundraising, that government wasn't gonna give them the money that they needed. So they started to hire professional fundraisers. The result of that, of course, was that we all were overwhelmed by a number of requests from people wanting our money. And now, while people were prepared to give, um, they were no longer prepared to give with the expectation that the organization knew how to use that money and all would be well. They wanted to be sure that there was going to be some change. Another issue is the world has shrunk. So whatever happens in one small quarter of, corner of the uh, globe will be felt and certainly will be known to each of us. We don't have to look too far back at our current example of COVID uh, pandemic, the impact of 9-11 uh, in the US are prime examples how this is one connected small world. The impact of that for fundraisers and for organizations is that people tend to see their world as a bigger, or at least their neighborhood, as the, really the whole world, not really just locally, um, the, the organizations that they have always known. Okay. Another change is that today there are corporations and individuals who have far more money the many national governments. And as a result, they have the power to create um, social problems and also to solve them. They are more powerful than many governments. So some interesting examples. As far back as uh, 2003, 24% of the largest revenue producers in the world were countries. Three times that number were corporations. In 1970, 70% of the funding for the developing world came from the government, only 30% from the private sector. That has flipped and even more so. In 2003, there was more money flowing into Latin American countries from uh, people going abroad, um, earning money and sending it back to their families than from all forms of government, or I'm sorry, development assistance. So money is in the hands of individuals. Next. Tax incentives have also made a big, big difference. Um, in order to help charities get the funding that they needed, CRA has created probably the most generous tax incentive system anywhere around the world. Before, 1960, uh, before 1996, um, a donation would account against 20% of your taxable income. Then that was increased to 50%, and today uh, you can credit um, a, a donation against 75% of your taxable income. In 1997, the capital gains inclusion rate for gifts of appreciated marketable securities was cut in half and the donation claim limit was increased. In May of 2006, the federal government eliminated all capital gains tax on donations of publicly traded securities. And in 2000, and I'm sorry, that was to public charities. And then in 2007, that was also expanded to include private foundations. So as a result, you can see how much giving has increased over uh, the, those years. For instance, if you look at, um, at the spread between 1997 and 2007, that 10 year period, the amount of private giving 
went from five and a half billion dollars to eleven and a half billion dollars. Now you'll see there was a bit of a slump and that uh, corresponds to the recession that we had, but then the numbers have gone back up again. So um, the trend, as I said, has been to um, more giving by individuals. And the trend has been towards people being much more involved and focused on what they're giving. And this is particularly true of the very wealthy or what we in the banking world call the ultra high net worth individuals. They're giving uh, more during their lifetimes than they're leaving in bequests, which is contrary to what it was in the past, because they want to enjoy their wealth. They want to be able to be involved in the projects, the organizations that they're supporting. They are taking a hands-on approach rather than just giving money. And for billionaires, they are trying to outdo one another to see who can give more, who can have the bigger impact on a problem. And this is very different from um, the tycoons, the great industrial tycoons of the early 1900s, who were more like patrons um, of um, charity rather than active participants. And some people are even going so far as to invest in for-profit ventures that are designed to solve societal problems rather than earning the money and then giving it to charity. Next slide. So as I said, among these people, the ultra high net worth, the, the, the very um, wealthy, the emphasis is on um, evaluating what they're doing, measuring the impact and trying to leverage their gifts. Their focus is a global, not in the local community anymore. They're more interested in supporting projects and programs rather than capital projects like buildings. They're also um, realizing that they can have a much greater impact by um, helping the very poor rather than just the needy people in their own countries. So in other words, the very poor in pre-industrialized uh, countries. And um, their approach to philanthropy tends to reflect um, their characteristics as, um, uh, an, uh, as a moneymaker, and this is particularly true of entrepreneurs. And of course, this is um, very much um, being done with the long-term view in mind because they are trying to make an impact and having, have a lasting um, effect. So another way of looking at this, um, in the 90s, this is uh, the time when I became involved in philanthropy, people were um, sort of starting to get away from giving to an institution. That was still sort of in the early part of the 90s, the way that people gave. And they gave to an organization that they trusted and that they knew and um, they, their gifts were unrestricted because they really felt the organization knew best how to use that money. The baby boom generation, they started to maybe support the same organizations, but they were much more interested in um, a project, a, something specific that they could identify with. And um, as a result, uh, charities found that they were uh, getting much more money because this was attractive to people to feel that they were involved, that they were having an impact and that they were contributing uh, to a solution. And today that trend has gone even further and people are looking at the kind of impact that they want to affect through their um, donations, through their gifts. They're not just giving money uh, to uh, a project that they like and certainly not to just the institution. So why do uh, Canadians give? Next slide, please. Um, Whenever this question has come up, and there have been many um, surveys done, the um, answers are always pretty much like this. Mostly people feel an obligation to give back to their communities. They want to help um, people in need. 
or there could be a personal reason or a family reason. For instance, there might be a child that um, was born with um, type 1 diabetes and that becomes a family cause. Or someone may have a personal interest, um, say they're interested in the opera or uh, in the environment, and that motivates them to, uh, to give. Obviously, they're financially able to do it. It doesn't hurt. Or it could be that uh, their personal values or their uh, religion tells them that this is something they really should be doing. And the tax incentive is also part of it, and I'm sure Ma uh, Mark will talk about that, but it is not usually what drives philanthropic giving. It may be involved in somewhat in uh, charitable giving. So I just wanted to conclude by quoting um, Winston Churchill, who seems to have a comment for almost everything in life. We make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Thank you. Mark, over to you. Thank you, Marvie. It's great to be here. I appreciate the invitation. I'm so looking forward to sharing with everyone what I'm quite passionate about when it comes to creating family legacies by maximizing impact and minimizing taxes. It's been a very, very busy time since the pandemic hit because for the last 30 years, we've been trying to convince people that they're gonna die one day. And it took a global plague for people to be much more aware of their mortality and also their incompletions, not having proper wills or structures in place, taxes. But one area that they haven't made completions on is the area of legacy. People have been very good at giving and being generous, but they haven't actually gone from what we call success to significance. I'm going to share with you what we help a lot of clients with and nonprofits like St. Mike's so that you can maximize your impact and actually minimize your costs so that you can make a bigger impact for you and your family going forward. Please, whatever we speak about today, there will be some tax advice. and We want to make sure that you speak to your proper CPA lawyers or, or your financial advisors as we go along. Now, we just had a changing of the guard in terms of some federal elections. Well, it's kind of the old coming in with the new again. And apparently there's an incentive to try to make our lives easier. So the government is gonna be introducing a new one page simplified tax return for all of us with one question on it. How much money did you make? Send it to us. Of course, we joke around, but we know it's not a question of if, it's a question of when that we're going to see a significant increase of taxes. And as a result, an increased opportunity for people to use philanthropy to actually use it for tax minimization. And here's the reality. Taxes are going up. You're going to see a possible wealth tax, inheritance tax, income tax, capital gains taxes. You know, how are we going to pay for all of the money that's sort of being spread out? So that's a reality. The other reality is that most people have done investing. So they've all been about accumulating assets, but very few people have done planning. And that's an area where you actually have to look now at preserving what you have and maximizing your income and looking at tax efficiency. The other reality is we've entered an information age, or I call it a misinformation age. Everyone's going online for information, but it still requires having professional advice from specialists to help you along the way. And everyone I'm sure has heard of Freedom 55, the famous line from London Life. Today, Freedom 55 is when your youngest child is 55. You know, it's, it's no joke. You know, kids are getting out of school. They're saddled with debt trying to find jobs post pandemic, you know, trying to buy real estate, we're going to be helping our kids for a while longer. So clearly charity begins at home. And we have to look at that as part of our planning. The good news is people are searching for meaning. They want to do good. There are organizations that will charge more than retail if there is a, a, a social responsible way of helping other people along the way. So that's good news for all of us. And, and St. Mike's is part of a, an initiative, which you're going to hear lots about. It's called Willpower. This was actually an initiative that was started in the UK over 10 years ago, where the research showed that of all the people who had wills in the UK, only 5% had put a gift in their will to charity. So they gathered money from all the nonprofits and put it into a, a pool, and they bought retail advertising, TV, radio, online, offline, billboard, with a very simple and elegant message. Leave a gift in your will. 
10 years later, the research showed that of all the people who had wills, it went from 5% 5 giving gifts to 9%. And that delta represents $50 billion of charity in the UK. That's B with a billion. We've started this now through the Canadian Association of Gift Planners. It was launched nationally in September. You'll hear all about it. But the plan is to raise awareness about giving. And the intention is to raise $40 billion of charity in the uh, charitable space. So everyone here is really going to be able to participate in that in a very big way. I mentioned that my start in the business was 30 years ago, but my real start actually was 47 years ago. And that's when my father of blessed memory died of a massive heart attack at the age of 50. I was 11. I was the youngest of four boys. And my mother, who was 48 at the time, had to go back to work to support our family. The reason was that my father was a, a busy engineer and there was very little savings. There was no will and there was no life insurance. So it was very hard for us. Fast forward, I worked with some of the most successful business owners and entrepreneurs, incorporated professionals, sports personalities, and, and families, and you'd think they'd have it all organized, but I'm going to suggest 80% of the time, it's just not true. They're so busy looking after everything and everybody else that their financial architecture and the furniture that they started with doesn't match their current situation. So we work in three areas, estate planning, tax minimization, and philanthropy. And what we want to talk about today is how you can create a legacy for your family, often by converting taxes into charity. And really, it takes a big picture. I wish I could tell you people call me and say, Mark, I want to give $20 million to St. Mike's or to this charity or whatnot. We kind of have to look for it. And that's why you really do need to look at things from a comprehensive point of view and, and look at things starting from wills and structures and insurance. And finally, at the very end, we always talk about charitable plan giving. And where this all comes from as far as planning, and this is a very important visual, is that most people that I meet have grown their assets to such a point that uh, they're going to continue to grow or level off. But the bottom line is you're going to have more money when they die than what they have today, which means that they're the custodian or trustee for the next generation. But what they don't realize is that they're partnering with the tax department on that money. So if you can do some planning to make sure you have a check mark that you're never going to run out of money, here's the tax today, here's the tax down the road, then you can use some of that never spend money that you're just paying taxes on either to preserve your estate for your family or incorporate philanthropy into your planning. And what's the issue? We have a lot of taxes to pay. Here's just an example of some of the things that would incur taxes in Canada. And here's a list just of taxes payable at death in Ontario. If you have RSPs and RIFs and pensions, those are taxed at almost 54%, over $220,000. If you've had any gains in appreciated shares or investment real estate or your business equity, the tax could be 27% of those gains. If you have a corporation with investments, the holdings could be taxed 47 to 70% if you haven't done any proper planning. And of course, then there's passive income tax, probate tax. Basically, what we're saying is there's a lot of tax to be paid. And really, the key message for everyone is to realize that we all have three possible beneficiaries to our state. You have family, you have the tax department, and you have charity. And each of us are allowed to pick two. Which two would you pick? Most people would say family and charity. So with proper planning, you could actually be remembered for leaving a large check to charity as opposed to writing a big check to the tax department. And, and here's one of my favorite quotes. Look, at we live in an amazing country with a lot of social services that we don't even pay for. And you have to pay taxes. It's part of the rules and regulations and the, the, the benefits that we receive. But this quote from Morgan Stanley says, there's no law that says you have to leave a tip. And that's really what we're talking about. We don't want to leave a tip. We want to try to use whatever the government's offering us in order to, to be able to do more and to protect our families. So how do we do it? Well, we really, we create what we call accidental philanthropists. There are two kinds of givers out there. Some people just have the DNA. They grew up giving. It was just part of their family dynamics and their family history. And then there are people who just haven't given. As a matter of fact, of the 38 million Canadians who are people who have tax returns, only 5 million have given money to charity. 
So imagine now letting those people who are not givers know that they have a choice where their taxes go to either charity or to the government. Suddenly those people become accidental philanthropists. And the people who are already giving now have an ability to be able to give more for the same amount they're paying or give the same amount for less. And who are those accidental philanthropists? And this is just something to keep in mind if it's either yourself or other people you know. Certainly anybody, widows, divorcees, and singles, they're one incident away from a very large tax disposition. We'll talk about that soon. Anybody who's sold or will be selling a business or investment real estate or appreciated securities, it's going to be the year they have their biggest tax bill, but it's also the year they can make their largest contribution to charity to offset those taxes. Anybody who's done or will be doing an estate freeze can donate private shares and save taxes. Or anyone right now, here we are at the end of the year, if you know that you're going to have taxes due in April and you have appreciated non-registered securities like stocks or, or mutual funds, donate those now and save taxes for April and create charity. If you have a foundation or donor advised fund, we have ways for you to amplify that, that gift or that money. If you have an old existing life insurance policy you no longer need, consider donating that to St. Mike's as we see. Or if you have an estate tax on death that's going to be payable, we can show you how to turn that tax into charity. And anyone who's left a gift or a bequest in your will, there are ways for you to actually make it even more cost and tax efficient along the way. So let's talk, talk simple math. Now, people are driven mostly when it comes to charity by their passion, something they're passionate about. They're passionate about St. Mike's. That's why they give. Only 13% of people are motivated by the tax. It's not the tax that drives it. So if you can take somebody's passion with the tax, now we're able to, to uh, maximize that gift. But high, high level, every $2 that you donate to charity, you save a dollar of tax. And, and a receipt that you receive in any given year can offset up to 75% of your personal tax that's due. Any additional amounts can be carried forward for up to five years. So if you give a lot today that you can't use, you can carry it up to five years. And a death, you should realize that any donations that are made on death can actually offset up to 100% of your estate taxes. Plus, the government allows you to go back one year in order to be able to save taxes then as well. This is all part of the Tax Act. So we're going to cover just a few ideas and then some case studies and hopefully provide you with some great information for you and your family. Gifting options, leave a gift in your will, a bequest, or looking at RSPs and WIT RIFs. We're going to look at gifting of securities, uh, and we're also going to look at gifting of life insurance. So as far as a gift in your will, a bequest, so one way to do this is just change your will. Consider leaving a gift to St. Mike's in your will for a specific amount or a specific percentage of your estate. Remember, every $2 you give to St. Mike's will save your family a dollar of tax. If you don't want to change your will, so then maybe look at your RSPs or RIFs and go to the financial institution you're dealing with. You can get what's known as a multiple beneficiary change form and make a certain percentage or dollar amount going to St. Mike's or any of your favorite charities. Again, you'll be doing something fantastic and saving your family from giving money uh, unnecessarily to, to tax. We talked about the RSP RIF tax time bomb. The government, unfortunately, is biased against widows, divorcees, and singles. They're disadvantaged. Why? Because in Canada, if you have a spouse and you die, everything rolls over to your spouse tax-free. It's on the second to die of a husband and wife that taxes are due. But if you're a widow, single, or divorced, you're one incident away from a very large tax disposition. So here it's not unusual. Somebody has $2 million sitting in an RSP. First thing you have to realize, it's not worth $2 million. It's only worth $920,000 to your heirs. So with proper planning, you could actually give $2 million to the charity and actually give your family about $1.5 million with planning. And there are other strategies as well that we'll actually speak about later on if this is money that you don't need or you don't need all of it and you're charitably inclined. Another way of giving is giving through personal securities. These would be uh, stocks. These would be mutual funds. These would be ETF, segregated funds. Uh, most people in Canada are giving through cash, checks, and, and uh, credit cards, which is the most cost and tax inefficient way to give. Here was an example where somebody was giving $50,000 of cash to charity. So that means they had to make 100000 
pay taxes, to have 50, to donate to charity, to save 25,000. But they're sitting there with a lot of appreciated non-registered securities. So instead they had $50,000 of shares, which had a cost base of 10,000. So there's a $40,000 capital gain. If they were to sell those shares, they would have to pay taxes of 10,800, which means they're not really worth 50,000. They're only worth just under 40,000. Instead, the government allows you to donate appreciated securities to charity, pay no capital gains taxes, and get a full charitable receipt for the donation to save taxes. That's why now is the best time to be thinking about that as far as your taxes that might be due in April and if you have non-registered assets. And this is really an end of year strategy that people should be considering. Speak to your professionals about it. We're happy to help. Interesting statistic. Remember I mentioned there are 5 million Canadians who actually give money to charity. Believe it or not, the statistics say only 5,000 of them have donated securities. That just means that nobody knows about this. And this is something the government has introduced and made it much easier for people to give because they know they can't afford to support all of these important charities in our lives. And that this is very important in, in, in terms of being able to create necessary money for the causes that we, we rely on. A higher level is if you have corporate securities. So these would be stocks or whatever sitting in a, in a holding company. Imagine you have the same $50,000 in shares with a cost base of 10,000. The advantage of doing corporately is it's a deduction for the company. Amazing. And the $40,000 capital gain actually gets credited to something called the capital dividend account and can be pulled out of the company tax-free. So you've, you've created money, a deduction for the company, money for charity, and got money out of your company tax-free. This is a great idea for anybody who's making a sale of a business or selling a lot of securities. One great way would be donate those securities to charity, save all that tax, and maybe use life insurance to replace the money that you donated to charity. So it's only a timing it's issue, but now you've created charity, reduced taxes, and have the money going back into your family's hands. We don't have a lot of what we call tax preferred asset or investments in Canada left. Other than these final four, your principal residence, which is not taxed, although they are considering reconsidering that. TFSAs are not taxed, but you can only put in $6,000 a year. Lottery winnings are not taxed. So don't buy your lottery tickets in the United States where they are taxed. And tax exempt life insurance is also a non-taxable asset. Anything else that you have, there's somebody from the CRA that has their handout that wants to participate in your good fortune, except for these four things. So it's important that we look at how you can utilize these for your family and for causes that you care about. And here's just showing you the after-tax cost of a donation to show you that all donations are not the same. This is an example of somebody who wants to give a million dollars to charity. And first example is giving cash. Second example is giving appreciated securities, assuming a zero cost base. So this could be cannabis stock or something, or using flow through shares or using a life insurance policy. And the key here, this tells you the cost per dollar for that donation. So cash will cost you almost 50 cents for every dollar you give. Using the securities, almost 23%, 23 cents per dollar that you give. Flow through shares, depending on what jurisdiction you live in and what's available, could be anywhere from five to 15 cents. And using a life insurance policy could be only 12 cents. So it's a way to make great impact at very low cost. Now let's just talk about gifting of life insurance policies right now. Many people have old policies that they bought, you know, when the kids were young, there was a mortgage, the kids needed education, or let's say they had a partnership agreement, the partnership's not there anymore. They could actually take that insurance policy and donate it to St. Mike's and get a fair market value receipt at the time that they donate the policy to save taxes today. Going forward, the premiums they pay are considered charitable donations, so they get a further tax receipt on that. I just did something for a older woman. She had a $150,000 insurance policy that would not change the dial on her estate planning. She donated it to a charity. She got an $87,000 charitable receipt that saves her $43,000 of taxes. And she gets recognized for giving $150,000 to charity without having to write a check for that. So in some cases, if the policy is valuable enough, the charity actually might actually pay for that policy going forward. So that's one option. Second option is consider getting a new policy. If you know that you have a, a state tax of a million dollars, 
why not get a $2 million life insurance policy for pennies on the dollars and make the charity the beneficiary of that policy? So the $2 million will go to the charity. I'll get a $2 million charitable receipt. The million dollars of state taxes is wiped out. And now you're remembered for giving $2 million to charity as opposed to a million dollars to the tax department for pennies on the dollar. And if you don't want to go to all that trouble, just consider going to your own insurance policy you have right now and change the beneficiary to add a percentage or a dollar amount to St. Mike's. All of contributions are greatly appreciated and it'll feel good and really create a legacy for your family. And here's just an example on the left-hand side. This is a 60-year-old couple who didn't do any insurance on the left side. They were just putting away $100,000 a year for 15 years, so a million and a half dollars, earning 4%, paying taxes all the way along. And as you can see, they put away $1.5 million. And after 30 years, the money hasn't even doubled. Why? Because they're in the tax grind. On the right-hand side, we use a tax-exempt insurance policy where we put the same $100,000 a year away for 15 years, so $1.5 million. But we have to buy insurance. In this case, initially, it's $2.5 million. So after 30 years, now the family has $4 million. So we've created almost $2 million more that they didn't have on the left side, on the right side. That's money they could now give away to charity if they wanted with ensuring that their children still got exactly what they were supposed to get along the line. It's something that should not be ignored. And here's a big secret. Life insurance can be owned and paid for by a private foundation or a donor advised fund. Most people don't know about that. So you can actually have a donor advised fund where, or a private foundation where the, the policy is paid for by the foundation. It's the beneficiary and it's the owner. And it can create as a result transformational dollars for charity and for families' legacies. Other gifting strategies, we mentioned above flow through shares. If you're already giving to charity, it's just a way to give to charity at the least cost possible. And certainly it's something to discuss with your tax professionals, but it's a very powerful way. And there are many companies that are offering this to Canadians. Charitable gift annuities. Let's say you're somebody who wants an income from your money. You could actually donate money to St. Mike's and receive a cash flow, an annuity payment for the rest of your life, but also receive a charitable donation to save taxes now. Charitable remainder trusts, if you have property, you want to donate to charity. So there's a way for you to get a tax receipt today to save taxes and be able to leave that to a charity down the road. CPP philanthropy is something I just want to touch on. And that's the right in Canada. When you turn 65, you're entitled to receive CPP. So a couple, a uh, 65-year-old couple will be collecting about $26,000 a year. And, and most of the time, they don't need it. It's taxed. It's reinvested and taxed again. If they're philanthropic, they could take that $26,000 and actually acquire a $1.5 million life insurance policy. If it's owned by St. Mike's, then your $26,000 is considered a donation and you don't pay any taxes on your CPP and you're recognized for leaving a million and a half dollar gift. Or alternatively, get the CPP, pay taxes on it, and get the $1.5 million policy, but make the beneficiary of it your charity, in which case that would save your estate $750,000 of taxes. Or my favorite is get the CPP, get the policy, make your children the beneficiary of that, and donate your registered money to charity that would have been taxed at 54%. At the end of the day, your kids get about 50% more than they were supposed to, and your registered assets go to a, a good cause. There's also something called return of premium life insurance. We get on a life insurance policy that goes to charity, and upon death, all the premiums go back to your family. And the last thing to keep in mind is something we call the policy preserver. There's $7 billion of term life insurance in Canada that falls off the books. That's $7 billion because they become too expensive or people don't need it anymore. So something you might want to consider is you can actually take some of that term insurance and you can actually convert it without any medical and then donate that policy to charity. And you'll either get a fair market value receipt on that to save you taxes today, or it could be something that you just want to do as part of your planning, but don't let those term policies fall away. They actually could be turned into some very, very good. Just as far as a few case studies, 
you know, here was one family that we worked with. They sold some real estate for $120 million. And I realize these are big numbers, but scalable. They sold some real estate for $120 million and they had a $20 million tax bill. Not so bad. And they were asked whether they'd be philanthropic. So they were introduced to me. What we did was we took of the $120 million, we took $40 million of that $120 and we set up a private foundation. Now what that did was that eliminated the $20 million of tax and turned it into charity. But the family was still out of pocket $40 million. So what we did was we used joint last to die life insurance with a finance strategy to get the money back into the hands of the next generation. It's just a timing issue, but the bottom line is they were made whole. They saved taxes, created a legacy by converting those taxes to charity, and still ended up having money at the back end for their family. Amazing. Anybody who's done an estate freeze, so they've frozen their private shares, you could actually donate those private shares to charity and turn, in one case, a $7 million tax bill into a $14 million donation, all at a cost of under $2 million, okay? So again, I, I, I don't want to get into the weeds. I'm just saying, don't overlook this. And anybody who has an RSP or a RIF that they don't need, you know, you could go ahead and donate that RSP to charity and move it totally over to the charity at a cost of about three and a half percent, and then use that money in that charity to buy insurance. We did this recently where we turned a million dollars of tax into four and a half million dollars of giving. And finally, if you've had a liquidity event, so we had, we just did a very big gift for another hospital where Somebody wanted to name a big part of the hospital that was being built, but they wouldn't need the money for another 11, 12 years. So we used an insurance policy owned by the charity to provide $2 million in year 11 and $2 million of year, in year 12 to the charity, and also a legacy gift at the back end, all utilizing uh, appreciated securities and other ways to fund it. So it was very efficient. We see there are four kinds of givers out there in the world. There are some people who are just anonymous. Don't put my name anywhere. Some people want to give because they want to set an example for others to follow. And then, of course, there are others who do it because they want to be remembered. They want their name on a plaque or on a building or whatnot. For others, they do it because it's great for business. Being philanthropic is a great way to create value in the venture that you're involved with. And here's just an example of a couple donating a million dollars to St. Joe's Hospital all at a cost for them of about $5,000 a year after tax for 20 years. So $100,000 to give a million dollar gift and be recognized today for that million dollar gift. How great is that for that family and for their children? Finally, you know, if I ask the group here, do you know the names of your grandparents? Most people would say yes. But how many of you know the names of your great grandparents? I would su suspect many don't. This is actually a picture of my great-grandparents, Aaron and Gross, in 1934, before they died in the Holocaust. Imagine if on January the 1st, you received an envelope in the mail, and inside there was a check for $10,000 from your great-grandfather. You think you'd remember their name? Well, with proper planning, there's ways to be remembered. And it's not so much for our children, it's more for our grandchildren. And the reason is they say the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. That's when the weather conditions are perfect. But if it's windy out, the apple's far from that tree. And if there's a tsunami like there is today, so much change going on, the apple doesn't even know it came from a tree. So with proper planning, there are ways to pass along those feelings, those legacies, those values to go from success to significance. And, and we really see there are two ways to do that. One is through religion, certainly, and another is through philanthropic planning and legacy. And you don't have to be Bill Gates. You don't have to be Warren Buffett to do this. This is available to anybody, providing you just want to take a little bit of time to find out how it could work for you. Next steps. I have something called the 48-hour rule. If you like some of the things that I talked about, please act upon it. Speak to Sandra Smith from the St. Mike's Foundation. If you'd like, we have uh, over 100 tax letter digests and a whole bunch of one-pagers that we're happy to provide for you that go into these case studies about how they work as opposed to getting too much in the weeds, exactly how they do them. Learn about it. Speak to your advisors. Contact us. But the one thing you can't do is don't ignore it. There's just too much riding on the line for your family and for the 
causes that you really care about. And then again, also consider your legacy gift to St. Michael's Hospital or Providence Healthcare. And one way to do that is through a million dollar life insurance policy. You know, if we have a hundred people on this call, imagine all of us creating a million dollar gift, that's a hundred million dollars. I would love to be part of that. And this is an example here of somebody at different ages giving a million dollar policy that's paid for only 10 years. So they're paying into this for 10 years only. The policy is owned by the charity. So they're getting a charitable receipt. And this is based on a joint last to die policy, sorry, a single life, not a joint last to die. These, these amounts could actually be less by up to 40% if you did this on a husband and wife. But as you can see here, a 40 year old male, it's $12,000 net after tax cost per year to be, be able to give a million dollars to a cause that you care about. So don't ignore it. Just to, to wrap up, you know, I, I hope that this has been of interest to you. You've learned some things. The one thing that I do know is that it's something that I know is near and dear to everybody on this call. Otherwise, you would not be involved in this. But it also requires that you take care of this while the sun is shining. Things have changed. People have gone. The world is, you know, really at a, at a sort of a crossroads. It's really now that is the best time to really be looking at the legacy that you want to leave. And all it requires is that you have a desire and sit down with a professional to see how it can be best implemented for you and your family. Here's my contact information. If I can help you ever, please be in touch, but please reach out to your professional advisors as well. And now we'd like to open it up for some questions. Wow, we got a lot of questions. So let's get started. I don't know if we'll be able to answer them all. Marvi, here's one for you. Uh, one of the uh, participants is asking, how can I set up my own private foundation? Okay. Well, um, a private foundation can be either a trust or a corporation. And um, people who choose a trust tend to be people who don't have family members and they're looking for somebody else uh, such as a trust company to look after their foundation on their death. People who do have family members and for whom their foundation wants to, is to be a legacy for the family choose the corporate structure. So to create a corporation is really very simple, straightforward. You just have to fill in a lot of, of uh, questions and uh, submit them to Corporations Canada and the uh, uh, cor corporation will be created within uh, 24 hours. Once it's uh, incorporated, you then have to seek registration from um, CRA. Um, to get official uh, recognition from CRA can take maybe a couple months or longer, depending on how long the queue is. But um, the good news is that the effective date of uh, registration as a charity becomes um, it, uh, in effect the day that CRA uh, receives the application. So at this time of year, you know, there's not very much time left uh, to get something or uh, register within CRA, but um, it's not a reason to wait for the formal registration if you really are intent on creating a foundation within this year. The other thing I would say is please use a charity's lawyer. Don't use your real estate lawyer or your corporate lawyer because they're not used to doing this and things can go wrong. So um, otherwise, it's a very simple and straightforward process, nothing to be afraid of. It is not complicated. Great advice. Here's another question that I'm going to ask you, Marvie, because it ties in with the whole idea of foundation. So the question is, what are the pros and cons of using a community foundation? What are the range of services offered by community foundations? What are the factors to consider in choosing a foundation? Marvy. Okay. Thank you. Well, um, maybe I should begin by defining what a community foundation is and comparing it to a private foundation. If you think of land that you own with a house on it, you have a complete responsibility for the house. Um, you can paint it purple if you wish, but you also have to cut the grass and uh, shovel the snow. That's like a private foundation. You have complete control over uh, the activities within the foundation. That is within the laws, of course. A community foundation, um, or I'm sorry, 
um, a donor advised fund or any other kind of fund within a community foundation is more like a condominium apartment in a building. You don't own the building. You are not responsible for its maintenance. You just own the space in which you are living. So that as a result, you have limited um, responsibilities. You can make decisions as to how the grants are going to be made, but you don't have to worry about the administration of the foundation. Uh, that is all carried out by the community foundation. So your fund, your donor advised fund or whatever kind of fund you create is just there to um, disperse funds to the charities that you choose but you don't have the responsibilities of actually being in touch with the donors. So people who are interested in um, giving money to the same organizations, maybe a year after year, they are much more attracted to a community foundation. People who want to get engaged with the um, organizations, the charities that they fund, who are really involved in the issues and who really want to be hands-on, not only with the grant making, but also with the investments in the foundation are more likely to choose um, a private foundation as a source of their philanthropy. Beautiful, okay, um, I'm gonna, here's some more questions. I'll, I'll pick this one up. Question is, is there a limit to how much of my RRSP I can donate to charity? Is it 75% of the total amount of my RRSP? So the first thing that people have to realize is that their RRSP is not worth 100% of what it is. If you take money out of that RRSP or you die and you don't have a spouse to pass it along to, as you know, it's taxed at about 53.53% on anything over $220,000. So if you don't need that money or you don't need all of it, certainly it's a great thing to consider charity. And you could actually donate 100% of that to charity. And I would suggest getting back to what Marvie said, it requires that you get proper advice to make sure that you paper it properly to make sure that it either goes directly to the charity and outside of your will, so there's no probate taxes, or it goes to your will and then gets distributed to the charities by your executor from the estate in order to get a benefit. So that's one thing that I think is very important. Another question that came up is I have a $75,000 life insurance policy that my parents bought for me when I was a kid. Can I donate that to St. Mike's and how do I do that? So that's, I mentioned that in my presentation, by all means, we all have this old financial furniture that's sort of sitting in our, in our asset drawer. And those uh, old insurance policies are golden, not only because they're golden for the charities where you can actually be giving $75,000, at least be recognized for giving $75,000, but you as a donor can actually get a fair market value tax charitable receipt for that donation. I mentioned before, uh, somebody who donated a $150,000 policy, he got an $87,000 charitable receipt, and now they're recognized for giving one hundred fifty dollars to the charity and going forward, the premiums they pay are considered charitable donations, which is fantastic. Uh, I'm just, I think we have time for one more, one more question or one minute. I'm just, I'll, I'll, I'm going to take this one, Marvy, and then we're going to wrap up. When's, uh, when's the best time to start creating a legacy? So the answer is today. You know, we have to take care of these things while the sun is shining. Clearly, we've just been through, we're going through a pandemic and anything can happen at any time. So if you've been motivated, encouraged by what we've said, please seek out professional advice. I'll end with a story. I had a, an individual who heard one of my presentations and approached me and we did some work. He was in his late 70s, no spouse, no children. And he had about a $3 million tax bill. So he was interested in doing something for a charity around sciences and academia. And we, we researched a bunch of different uh, strategies you could take. Unfortunately, uh, I called him up after many months and he told me it wasn't a good time. He was at the hospital. He just had a heart attack and he would be back in touch with me. A week later, I saw the notice that he had actually died and I attended the funeral. It was very, very small. And I thought, such a shame. $3 million of money could have been used to create a legacy for himself, but instead it was going to be going to the CRA, which they needed to, but a legacy. He could have been using that. So 
getting back to that answer, the best time to look after this is clearly now while the sun is shining. So please reach out to, to us for all the questions we couldn't answer. Please reach out to Marvie or to me or to your professionals. We'll be happy to answer them. At this point in time, I would like to uh, pass the meeting over to Michael Flux to conclude today's program. Marvie and Mark, thank you so much for sharing your strategies and for answering everyone's questions. I'm Mike Flux, campaign vice chair at St. Michael's Foundation, chair of St. Michael's Foundation's advisory task force on plan giving, and executive vice president and portfolio manager at Connor Clark and Lund Private Capital Limited. I'm here today to wrap up today's event, even though we could probably keep going for a few more hours. I'm sure the talk resonated with everyone. It certainly did with me. As an investment advisor, I can't stress enough how important it is to pay attention to the details and legacy planning. I'm so appreciative of all the generous donors who support St. Michael's Foundation through plan giving. On behalf of the foundation, I wanna express deep gratitude to all of you. You're maximizing your impact now as you support the life-saving work our healthcare teams do every day at St. Michael's and Providence Healthcare. And I can tell you, there has really never been a more exciting time to join us. We're on the brink of some bold initiatives that are poised to totally reinvent the patient experience. I can't say too much about it yet, but you'll be amongst the first to find out in the coming weeks and months. As Robin said earlier, this is the second in our new Create Your Legacy series. Stay tuned, there's more to come. In the meantime, feel free to reach out to Sandra Smith at smith, S-A-N, at S-M-H dot C-A. You can also find her contact details on the St. Michael's Foundation website. She can answer any of your questions about today's event or your charitable bequest plans. Thank you all for attending and have a wonderful evening.